As soon as computers came into existence, scientists began fanaticizing about how they could revolutionize our world. Even in the 1960s, they theorized that one day computers would be able to think for themselves. The first attempt and the beginning of AI all starts with psychologist Frank Rosenblatt in 1957. In that time, he developed what was called Perceptron. A Perceptron was a digital neural network that was designed to mimic a few brain neurons. Just a year later, the media caught onto the idea and the hype was strong. In 1958, the New York Times reported that the Perceptron was to be, quote, the embryo of an electronic computer that will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. Unfortunately for Frank, despite the hype, his neural network system didn't work very well at all. This was because he only used a single layer of artificial neurons, making it extremely limited in what it could do. And even worse, there wasn't much that could be done about it at the time. Computers of that day could only handle this simple setup. These problems were never solved, and by 1969, the computer science community had abandoned the idea, and with that, AI was dead. Everyone may have given up on the idea, but decades later, a keen computer scientist by the name of Jeffrey Hinton thought that everyone else was just plain wrong. He theorized that the human brain was indeed a neural network, and the human brain evidently made for an incredibly powerful system. To him, this was as much proof as he needed. Artificial neural networks had to work somehow. Maybe they just needed some tweaking. Hinton saw the genius in the idea that everyone else missed. It seemed to me there's no other way the brain could work. It has to work by learning the strengths of connections. And if you want to make a device do something intelligent, you've got two options. You can program it or it can learn. Right. And we certainly weren't programmed, so we had to learn. So this had to be the right way to go. So you have relatively simple processing elements that are very loosely models of neurons. They have connections coming in. Each connection has a weight on it. That weight can be changed to do learning. And what a neuron does is take the activities on the connections times the weights, adds them all up, and then decides whether to send an output. And if it gets a big enough sum, it sends an output. If the sum is negative, it doesn't send anything. And all you have to do is just wire up a gazillion of those, just figure out how to change the weights, and it'll do anything. It's just a question of how you change the weights. After studying psychology, Hinton moved into computer science and pursued his lifelong quest of modeling the brain. Originally from Britain in the UK, he moved to the University of Toronto. In Toronto, he would go on to develop multi-layered neural networks. He and his team quickly realized that the problem with Frank Rosenblatt's single layer approach was that more layers were needed in the network to allow for much greater capabilities, and the computers of the day were now powerful enough to handle it. This multi-layer approach solved the problem that Frank Rosenblatt had. The neural networks were much more capable Today, we call this multi-layered approach a deep neural network. In 1985, Hinton co-authored a paper which introduced the Boltzmann machine. Boltzmann machines are the fundamental building blocks of early deep neural networks. You can think of them like the Ford Model T of neural networks. Without getting into the details, the concept is to have groups or layers of neurons communicate in such a way where each artificial neuron learns a very basic feature from any data. For example, each neuron could represent a pixel in an image that the network is trying to learn. Long story short, the result is a program that can make accurate guesses and predictions about data it's never seen before. Soon, others began innovations based off deep neural networks. A self-driving car was built in the late 80s on neural networks. And later in the 90s, a man by the name of Yan Li Kun would build a program which recognized handwritten digits. This program would go on to be used widely, but Yan Li Kun would also go on to be an AI pioneer in his own right. Li Kun would study under Jeffrey Hinton and would lead the research that made Hinton's theory of backpropagation a reality. Backpropagation, in simple terms, is the process of computers learning from their mistakes and hence becoming better at a given task much the same way humans learn from trial and error. However, the idea of AI being used for much more was short-lived. The field was stifled by two problems. One, slow and inadequate computing power. And two, 
a lack of data. A burst of investor confidence was eventually met with disappointment and the research money began drying up. Jeffrey would become ridiculed and forced to the sidelines of the computer science community. He was seen as a fool for his long-standing faith in a failed idea. Undeterred by the opinion of his colleagues, Hinton pursued his dream with an unfazed obsession. In 2006, the world had finally caught up to him. Computer processing speed had grown significantly since the 90s. Moore's law, observed by Intel's co-founder Gordon Moore, stated that the number of transistors per square inch doubles about every two years. This meant that computers were growing in processing power exponentially. That's the first problem solved. Meanwhile, thanks to the advent of the internet some 15 years earlier, a wealth of data had been acquired, and this solved the second problem. The ingredients of AI were now there. The computers were powerful enough, and there was enough data to play with. The birth of the modern AI movement can be traced back to a single date, September 30th, 2012. On this day, Jeffrey and his team created the first artificial deep neural network to be used on a widely known benchmark image recognition test called ImageNet. Hinton's program was called AlexNet, and when it was unleashed on this date, it had performance like no one had ever seen. AlexNet destroyed the competition, scoring an over 75 success rate, 41% better than the best previous attempt. This one event showed the world that artificial neural networks were indeed something special. This sent an earthquake through the science community. A wave of neural net innovations began, and soon the world took notice. Images were just the beginning. Soon Neuronet AI was tackling video, speech, science, and even games. Today, we see AI everywhere. Singularity is the concept of AI surpassing human intelligence. After this point, what happens is a bit of an open-ended question. By default, computers would be able to reinvent better versions of themselves. They could progress fields such as medicine and science without human direction. AlphaGo Zero is a graphic illustration of the possible rate of this progress. In 2016, experts thought that it would take an AI around 12 years to beat a human at the ancient game of Go, a game with virtually infinite possibilities, and a game that relies on human intuition to master. But the experts were very wrong. Their 12-year prediction in reality was actually zero. An AI did in fact beat the grandmaster of Go in that very same 2016 year. The next version of the AI, AlphaGo Zero, learned to play the game from scratch and beat the previous version, 100 games to zero, in just three days. How many years away do you think we are from a neural network being able to do anything that a brain can do? I don't think it'll happen in the next five years. Beyond that, it's all a kind of fog, so I'd be very cautious about making a prediction. Is there anything about this that makes you nervous? In the very long run, yes. I mean, obviously, having other super intelligent beings who are more intelligent than us is something to be nervous about. It's not going to happen for a long time, but it is something to be nervous about in the long run. What aspect of it makes you nervous? Well, will they be nice to us? Also, the movies always portray it um, as an individual intelligence. I think it may be that it goes in a different direction where we sort of develop jointly with these things. So the things aren't fully autonomous, they're developed to help us, they're like personal assistants, and we'll develop with them, and it'll be more of a symbiosis than a rivalry.